Okay, adequate notice of this meeting was provided by sending such notice to the Asbury Park Press, Middletown Patch, and the Middletown Township Public Schools District website. And the posting of such notice at the Augustine Minor Administrative Offices and each elementary, middle, and secondary school in the district. Roll call. Mrs. Caminiti. Mr. Cafranco. Here. Mr. Donlin. Mr. Dymo. Here. Mr. Little. Mrs. Minuis. Here. Mrs. Wright. Mrs. Stella. Here. Mrs. Rogers. Here. I need a motion to go into executive session for settlement agreements, the HIV update, personnel matters, and legal matters. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention. All right, this meeting will now come to order. Adequate notice of this meeting was provided by sending such notice to the Asbury Park Press, the Middletown Patch, and the Middletown Township Public School District website and the posting of such notice at the Augustine Minor Administrative Offices and each elementary, middle, and secondary school in the district. Roll call. Mrs. Caminiti. Here. Mr. DeFranco. Here. Mr. Donlin. Mr. Jimo. Here. Mr. Little. Mrs. Minuis. Here. Mrs. Wright. Mrs. Stella. Here. Mrs. Rogers. Here. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and the moment of silence for Rick Understand. High School North Science teacher passed away on Thursday, July 18, 2019. Mr. Understein began his career in the district in 2002. For Suzanne Mosley, recently retired Thorne Middle School special education teacher, passed away on Friday, July 19, 2019. Mrs. Mosley served in the district from 1991 to 2019. For William Westerberg Sr., retired custodian, who passed away on July 5, 2019. Mr. Westerberg served the district for 16 years, retiring in 2013. His sons, Paul and William Jr., are employed by the district. Mr. Understein, Mrs. Mosley, and Mr. Westerberg were respected and valued members of our school community and will be missed. We extend our condolences to the Understein, Mosley, and Westerberg families. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I'm a, I'm a, yeah. I'm All right, we're back to technology. All right, filling in for Dave Siliak this evening, uh, I want to report that uh, our technology summer projects update uh, includes uh, that our interns have started. Uh, they started July 8th, and they've already begun making an impact. Uh, as of this week, the technology department has already accomplished uh, upgrading of approximately 30% of all of our district PCs to Windows 10. Um, all tech tubs, which include six Apple iPads each, have been set up and configured for our kindergarten classes. They will be delivered to the classrooms at a later date. Our setup of the first and second grade tech tubs is currently underway. Um, all returned Chromebooks have been inspected, tested, and reconfigured for spare use. Uh, those that are unable to be reused are in the process of being cannibalized for parts. Uh, and then also we've installed and configured our new district server file backup solution. We are not backing up all of our internal data and service to the new. Uh, we are now backing up all of our internal data and service to the new appliance and the cloud. So that was Dave's update. Things are moving along. So. Thank you. Okay, moving on to curriculum and instruction. Good evening. Um, we have a few uh, informational items. We just wanted to give an update from the curriculum department. Uh, we too are offering our summer program, SOAR, um, Summer Opportunity for Academic Readiness. Uh, we are currently in the second week of the ELA program. Uh, attendance has been very positive. Um, it's been a very successful first two weeks. The teachers have been working um, with students in small groups. Uh, addressing uh, their needs, their academic needs, based on the data that was collected over the course of the school year um, with their classroom teachers and the interventionists or the reading development teachers who they, the students have been working with. Um, they use data such as Linkit, um, the NJSLA reports, formerly known as ARC, um, iReady data for our middle school students, DRA, and FMP data uh, for our running records for elementary. Um, we have an abundance of high interest texts and novels that we have been able to purchase through Title uh, I grants um, to support the students in uh, promoting reading throughout the summer months. Uh, the students, the Title I students who are partic participating in the summer program will be gifted with additional books to take home for the remaining weeks in the summer um, to really address and reduce the summer slide that we all know oftentimes can occur. Um, our AP classes, we are overwhelmed uh, and very uh, happy with the results this year. We have more than tripled our AP enrollment. Uh, we have 540 enrollments this year for summer AP coursework. Um, we do credit it mostly to the fact that we have created a hybrid model where students have seat time with uh, their teachers, but they also have online uh, Google Classrooms and ways in which that they can communicate and receive um, guidance from their teachers uh, remotely. So that has really helped, because uh, we know that middle school, high school students, uh, future high school students, you know, the rising eighth graders have busy lives in the summer. Um, so we're happy that we can accommodate their needs in that way. Uh, Mrs. Caruso is gonna give a quick update on the Brookdale um, Early College Academy uh, program that, ha that is experiencing a slight change uh, due to Brookdale's um, uh, request. <laughs> you may be aware that there were originally 24 students enrolled in the Early College Academy and that was this past year, ninth graders and 10th graders. There were 24 between the two high schools together. We currently now only have 18 students in the Early College Academy. Six of the students have opted to drop out of the Academy. Four of them were from the science track, two of them were from the arts track so far. Um, of the 18 that remained, 15 are in arts, 3 are in science, 8 are from high school north, 10 are from high school south. Um, the status may change further for some of the students because they just got their AP test results back and that's one of the requirements to stay in, so we'll be looking at that more closely to see what, you know, what the next development is. But the main reason that students have opted to drop out of the science track is because Brookdale has been unable to offer classes that the students are required to take to meet our schedule as was part of the original memorandum of agreement with Brookdale. In order for the students to take the biology lab classes, because a lab requires more time, they would not have gotten back to their high schools in time for their AP courses. 
they would have missed a substantial amount of their AP classes. And we've met with them repeatedly, and there was no way to work that out. So finally, what they decided to do, the three students that are remaining in the science track are going to be taking their classes in the evening at Brookdale and providing their own transportation, because that was the only way they could take the classes that were required. The other students opted to either change to the arts track instead of the science track, or to leave the ECA program altogether. And that's why we have 18 out of 24 students from London. It's not just Middletown that had difficulty with um, the Early College Academy. The other districts that were also involved with Brookdale and the Early College Academy had scheduling difficulties and other difficulties. We just had scheduling difficulties. They had others as well. As a result, Brookdale has, um, will no longer walk from the Early College Academy effective this fall. So we will have no freshmen going into it. We'll just have 10th and 11th graders next year. Our previous 9 and 10 will be 10 and 11 next year. But we will not have the Early College Academy for any incoming freshmen, nor will any other district Time. What Brookdale is doing is they're um, considering the possibility of ordering something called a middle college academy. The difference being that middle college academy means when a child graduates from high school, they have one year of college under their belt instead of two, which the early college academy had, two years being an associate's degree. So they haven't worked out the details for that yet. We haven't agreed to anything yet because we want to see what the details are, you know, and hopefully they have agreement that they strike with us, they would stick with this time because we didn't see this coming. So we wanted to update you that that is the case. Questions? Yeah, Mrs. Crusoe, uh, a couple questions. Uh, you mentioned that other districts are also in the same struggle with Brookdale. Are we working with the other districts to make sure that you know our students are being treated equitably? Except, you see, the other districts, they had problems even with the arts track. Our only difficulty was the science track, and we were the only one that had the science track. So and we were able to work out the arts track just fine. You know, so. is, is Brookdale... I don't want to say compensating, but you know, this is taking away from our students' time. You know, it's time they could be used on other classes or having jobs or, or a life. So, is, are they offering anything by way of compensation, whether it's a stipend for transportation, book costs? For the anything? three students, you mean that are going to be going there at night? No, they haven't worked with them anything special. If they want to stay in the track. They're providing their own transportation. They're taking four classes still in our high schools during the day mm -hmm. instead of a full class load to make up the class they're taking at night. And this is an existing Brookdale class that they're attending? Yes, this is biology of the lab, the one this year, but there will be other courses in the next two years until they finish the program. We're trying to see the kids who are in the program through to the end. But it sounds like they're effectively reneging on the... Exactly. So, exactly what, so what recourse is there in the memorandum that we have? Uh, to uh, advo to advocate for our students. <laughs> We've had many meetings. We've had many, yeah. Uh, there's very, very little recourse. Their primary issue uh, rested in their current contract with their faculty and when they are obligated to run courses, the times and days, as well as their accreditation from middle states. And because we offered, because they're actually, I just want to, to, just to make a slight correction, we weren't, the wall also offered the, the Associate of Science track for the first time with us. So we, we, there was actually two of us. And we offered to host the Brookdale class, science class here in our campus and allow the wall students to come and just send a Brookdale uh, professor here. They said that middle, their middle states accreditation would not allow that because the, uh, there has to be an X number of credits accrued on their campus. And that was new for Brookdale. They didn't have that They did not have required. that When they entered into the agreement with us, they didn't have that requirement on them. For the, and plus, the people that made that agreement with us are no longer part of their program. They've left the um, college. Not that that should matter because they did agree to it, but that was one of the other reasons they gave us. So the fact that they canceled it all together it's never for incoming freshmen. For incoming the ones that are there, they're trying to. They're not really out. looking to work it out to make it work for No, them. I don't think they realize the problems they were going to have with it. And that's for all it. districts who had existing students, they are like us, they are allowing those students to complete their tracks. They're not accepting any new students from any of the affiliated partner districts, you know, us, um, Wall, Keyport, uh, other places, um, Hazlitt. Hazlitt. Um, St. John, yeah. But that's why, and, and they have received a tremendous amount of feedback from all of us, us included. Yeah, met with them collaboratively. Times. Yeah, so that's why they're looking to uh, set up a meeting with, uh, I know Tara Nicholas is, uh, is preparing to attend with Mrs. Caruso um, about this middle college opportunity. But, I mean, not every one of the six children that left the academy left because of the science track agreement. There were um, a couple of students who realized that the workload was more than they bargained for going in. And um, one of them, for example, was a uh, track runner and they just couldn't do everything that they had committed to. So it wasn't just that they were making the agreement. That was what upset us, obviously. I, I, I'm just wondering if, 
if Dr. George and Mrs. Rogers should be, you know, reaching out to the Board of Freeholders to, to, to voice a complaint because the county oversees Brookdale and it's a, it's a reneging on an agreement with multiple school districts within the county. I mean, it, I, I know that there's been a lot of stuff going on in Brookdale that reflects poorly on it, um, but it, I don't think that our students should, should have to pay a price. I mean, the evenings for a high school student are valuable. It's ridiculous. We met with all the parents of all of these students, sure. and they were the ones who said, "Could our students go at night rather than they asked for that?" Well, asked for that. That's, that's great. That's great, but it doesn't, it doesn't lessen the yeah. responsibility. No. I just wanted you to know that was how it's going to be. I I met with uh, Dr. Richards, the executive county superintendent, and Dr. Stout, the current president, who was uh, uh, a member of the administration when this was put together. He's a long-term uh, administrator at Brooktail, um, and. Uh, he's assured both Dr. Richards and myself that you know that this is an accreditation issue, and that um, that they you know it's not something that's within their control, and that's why it's why it's happening. It's, it's an issue of accreditation. So uh, we we are looking to see potentially what we can build with the middle level academy, um, and uh, and and going from there. Um, I have not communicated directly to the freeholders. Um, I'm not averse to that if you want. Uh, if uh, Mrs. Rogers, the president of the board, directs me to, I can certainly be able to uh, set up that meeting, and I'm sure. Yeah. That'd be great. Sure, they're, they're, they're very responsive. Is there any sort of backup plan, a relationship we have with another college that would give us the we same have, sort of deal? We have multiple. Yeah, we have multiple affiliation mm -hmm. agreements, mm -hmm. virtual mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. we have. Yeah. We actually have another one coming out tonight, but we um, have many. We have the Seton right. Hall, yeah, we have the yeah. Hall, Ryder, Georgia Court, Fairleigh Dickinson. Yes. Um, so we have a number of colleges that are students and college approved college credit. This was unique because Brookdale is so close by and it's yeah. yeah. program. It's convenient for the yeah. kids. It yeah. sounded great going in. They didn't realize the hardship they would have. Um, I, I hope that when they do this middle program, that before we get our kids excited and encouraged to go through with it, that doesn't guarantee it's going to happen. We said that. In place. We want to know because all the details. The, the, the track record is not good. It's not fair to put our kids in that position. Okay. It should be much easier for them to work out one year versus two years of college credit. Okay. So um, just a further update on our recent uh, memorandum of understanding, our agreement with Keensburg. Um, Mr. Ranella, Ms. Nicholas, and I met with uh, Mr. Covert um, to discuss how we would uh, expand opportunity for our students to attend uh, the criminal law um, track, their, their pathway, their, their um, academy. And uh, I believe, Mr. Ranella, you and Ms. Nicholas are preparing to put out an announcement for a parent and student information uh, session, uh, an upcoming evening in the next week or two. Um, the instructors from the Criminal Justice Academy at Keensburg will be coming to meet with parents and students to talk about uh, the coursework and the accreditation and the job opportunities that exist once the students complete the coursework and graduate. Um, we have uh, three courses that, that Keensburg offers. Um, it's Police and Community, Criminal Justice, Introduction to Criminal Justice, and Law and Safety. Um, and the students also have to complete an internship. So they can opt to do it as a two-year program where they will complete two courses during the day at Kingsburg and then travel back to our high schools, um, or they can do it as a one-year program and they just won't have all the coursework completed. Um, but they are, uh, we're really excited about being able to expand our offerings by this partnership with a uh, neighboring district. We also um, discussed AP coursework because that was our part of the agreement that we, if we had available seats in any of our AP courses, um, specifically at High School North, because of course that's a little bit easier to accommodate the Kingsburg students with travel time. Um, and we have been able to identify six AP courses where there are um, a number of seats available uh, to host those students, including AP Calculus, um, English and Lang, and um, Statistics, which is off the top of my head, yeah. Um, and I think uh, there was a... Yep. Human Geography, Modern World History, and Human Anatomy and Physiology, which is actually a dual enrollment course with Seton Hall, so those students can include college credits like ours. Um, I know Ms. Dr. Tiedemann and I are going to be meeting with Mr. Covert to talk about the opportunity um, to partner with them to utilize their Beacon program, their Behavioral Disabilities program, 
as an alternate placement for students when they don't maybe find success in our in-district uh, behavioral disabilities programs and we're looking for an alternate um, uh, placement for them prior to going to um, a private facility if that's an option that the child 17 would like to explore. So we are in the process of completing all of that and communicating, of course, the criminal law opportunity to students and parents at both high schools, so now north and south. Uh, we do have some voting agenda items. There was the last um, the uh, attachment that was added yesterday to send one of our biology teachers at High School North to the AP um, course, summer course. Uh, that is because, unfortunately, with Mr. Unterstein's passing, he was our AP biology teacher at Miami North. Uh, we do have a teacher who has stepped up and is uh, ready to assume that teaching assignment, but he does need to complete the, the coursework over in August. So we had to add that as a last uh, minute item under professional development conference attendance. Um, we do have the two resolutions uh, to uh, vote on this, this month, and that's the ESL magnet program and our professional development plan. I believe we're in um, second year of both plans. Uh, they usually run on three-year cycles, so these are just resolutions to continue the plans that we were approved two years ago. Um, with our magnet ESL program, we're not changing our host facilities. Uh, at the elementary level, you know that we offer our ESL program services to students at Middletown Village, Fairview, and Leonardo. Um, and at the middle school and high school, uh, we have Bayshore Middle School and then High School North. Uh, what we're going to expand is uh, training additional classroom teachers in the PSYOP method so that when the students are um, pushed in for inclusion into our general education classes, those teachers are able to accommodate their needs and modify their curriculum or accommodate them in whatever way uh, is required. Uh, we also are making a big push, uh, a great effort, to um, ensure that students who are eligible for services uh, participate and are registered in those magnet programs. Um, we'd like to increase our participation rate, so that's another area we're looking to expand. Um, there is an affiliation agreement with the University of Scranton uh, to offer student teaching opportunities and professional practicums for University of Scranton students to come here. We would host them. Um, we would have mentors, uh, our teachers, to serve as their cooperating um, advisor. And that's it for this one. Any questions? Just to go back to that ESL mm -hmm. magnet program, so no child is already enrolled at Village or Fairview or Leonardo will have to move to a different school? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you. And nothing else is changing. Everything's exactly the same. With ESL? Yes. Yep. But there was, there is talk out there that kids are being moved and you know just to put it on the record I think it's good that we're putting on the record that's not the case oh, no. because you know there was a concern that kids were before it started in one program and now we're moving them to another and it's very clear that you're saying that's not going to no. happen no. So. same same host sites as we've had from this term yeah. <coughs> thank you thank you okay moving on to facilities and finance Okay, under facilities, we have an information update on our summer projects. Uh, I have a, a list that we are working off of. It, it's um, a list of all the things by school that I'll ask you to take one and pass it down. I've asked Mr. Cahill, our director of facilities, to come and give you some insight on the progress we're making in all the buildings over the summer and the things that are going on. For a visual, follow Mr. Cahill on Twitter. He's pretty, uh, he's pretty My daughter's on the Twitter store. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Yeah, we're trying to uh, trying to get some of the stuff that we're doing out there for everyone to see. Great, great. excited about some of the stuff we're, we're doing. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of the uh, things and answer any questions you have about anything else uh, on the sheet. As you can see, there's uh, we have quite a bit going on. Uh, we'd like to have at least one one pretty substantial project going on in school. And some we have uh, we have more. Uh, high School North, uh, we have the theater uh, lighting and control upgrade that's, uh, that's in, in full uh, swing right now. Uh, the uh, Southern's Electric is in there and they're, uh, they're up in the ceiling running wires and uh, you know under the stage. Uh, if you were to go in there now, it, it's pretty incredible uh, what, what's happening. Uh, while that's going on, we're also, we have everything plastic uh, taped off and we're painting the uh, ceiling in there. I don't know if anyone has taken note of what the ceiling looked like in the past, but uh, it's in dire need of a coat of paint and it's, it's getting it. 
Uh, so uh, that, that area is going to look terrific. Uh, we're also uh, doing a lot of work in the library, the movie center. Uh, we uh, pulled up all the carpet. We, uh, at that point, we took the opportunity to paint all the walls. Um, we have uh, the carpet tiler going down now, and we're actually giving them the confined maker's uh, space there with the nice and tile. And it actually will go lead them right to the sink that's uh, that's behind the uh, the glass wall there. So I know the uh, uh, the teachers and all uh, they're pretty excited about that. It's something that they've been uh, been hoping to have for quite some time. And we're going to be doing a similar thing in South uh, with the uh, the tile that uh, we have about today in August. Um, and uh, as far as the uh, high school South, uh, just to jump around a little bit. Uh, the, uh, we started sanding the uh, floor in the main gym. Uh, that is going to look really good. I was over there today. I took some pictures on Twitter. But anyway, uh, you can see the progress. I mean, the floor, it's just like bleach white. It's really, really going to look nice uh, when it's done. The, the wood that they used uh, in that, uh, those floors uh, when they installed it was really top notch. So it's going it's to really show through. So, uh, and along with that, uh, we have some, uh, uh, the school, uh, uh, principal and the athletic director, they designed a uh, custom logo that's going to be painted in the, uh, in the center. And, uh, you know, the, the court itself is going to be lined out, blocked out really nice. Uh, so it's, uh, that's coming out well. Uh, one of the other things that we're adding in both high schools and the smaller gyms is volleyball. We're preparing for, for that. So uh, one of the things before, uh, before August is up, those uh, lower gyms will be refinished. Uh, and in the process, we're going to make sure we get the regulation volleyball lines in there for, for September. Um, oh, I forgot uh, one other thing in high school New York. We have a drainage project that's uh, behind the uh, maintenance uh, area. Uh, and what's happening is it is flooding out the uh, field house as well. Uh, we, um, that went out to bid. We had some, uh, some holdups on permits, but everything's been uh, released and ready to go. And I'm meeting with uh, Fiori uh, paving it and excavating tomorrow morning at, uh, at 11 o'clock to, uh, to get the uh, uh, project uh, kicked off. So we're hoping that should uh, be done before, uh, before the first field hockey ball hits the, uh, hits the ground. Um, Bay Shorts, uh, we, there used to be the TV uh, recesses in the hallways that uh, turned out to be, TVs no, were never installed, they turned out to be junk collectors. So uh, the principal asked us if we could do something with that. And what we did was we actually, if we turned them into little enclosures where they can actually have locking storage throughout the hallways. Seems to, uh, he's very happy, he called me up and said, you know, it really was a great, uh, great use of, of dead space. Um, so, uh, you know, that seems to have gone well. Over at um, Thompson, we're uh, sanding the floor over there. That hasn't begun yet, that should be next week. But we have painted the, uh, the gym. It looks really sharp. I don't know if uh, any of you have been over there, but it's all gray with the school colors. It really, really came out great. And uh, we're doing work in the locker rooms uh, at both, uh, both middle schools, uh, painting and updating and, and uh, uh, replacing fixtures when they, where they need them. Uh, the elementary schools, we have uh, uh, Navison. We're set to do the, uh, the Monmouth Avenue sidewalk. Uh, that's a, a real mess that uh, we put a patch on it last year and uh, we're, we're real thankful we can rip that out and replace it this year. Uh, New Monmouth, we put a fence around the, uh, the playground. Uh, you know, it was a situation where, um, you know, we wanted to make sure we could contain all the, uh, all the students there. So now it's a, it's a Princeton uh, in property. There's a gate that leads to a path that actually will take you out to uh, New Monmouth Road. So that's all gated off now. Uh, the gate does have, uh, it's key to every teacher's classroom key. So then in the event that they had to go, every, every teacher will be able to, to open the gate as well. Um, let's see what else. Uh, uh, new, um, at Nutswamp, we air conditioned the main office. Uh, that was something that was uh, long overdue. Uh, 
the uh, they had a conference area that all the kids broke in. You know, I was, it was kind of terrible. So uh, in order to, to correct that, we had an opportunity to, to, just for a little extra money and not much labor, to air condition the, the main office and the nurse's office as well. So uh, that that was a great project, and now we uh, we don't have to have to worry about the uh, heating and air conditioning there for you know, the next uh, at least ten years. Or so. uh, one of the other things, I mean, everything else is. Uh, you know, listed, not, not too big of a deal, but one of the other things I just wanted to touch on that you'll see is uh, something to do, we're gonna be power washing. Uh, and we're gonna be power washing the entrances of every school. So that, uh, you know, we just wanna put our, our, our best and cleanest foot forward. So when visitors come to our schools, we're gonna start this year with the main entrances and then we're gonna try to, try to expand on that. But we're gonna make sure that, uh, that the path leading up to and everything above and around the uh, the entrances is power washed clean, so that um, you know the new visitors, the kindergarten parents who are coming up for the first time, they'll have uh, you know they'll have that feeling that uh, that you know we're, we're doing the best we can. To keep things, uh. So that's kind of all I have. I have a couple questions. Sure, sure. Where are we with the Thompson Fields that we did last year? Okay, the Thompson Fields. We, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I should have. Uh, we are in the process, I work uh, what's called a water wheel. And it's a portable sprinkler that uh, we can use for all three levels of the field. Uh, we're in the process right now of uh, making material list and putting together to run a uh, two and a half inch water line from the school all the way up to the, uh, to the top field. And there'll be three hydrants that we can plug into. So uh, we anticipate before the start of school having irrigation available to the uh, to all three of those fields, and with that, uh, then the the program will really be able to take off. Uh, it did quite a bit last year, but we're kind of limited without uh, without irrigation. Uh, so we're expecting big things in the fall. If you look at what what the program did in the high schools, it's absolutely amazing. And um, it's going to happen at Thompson too. So it's this close. Uh, you know, we've made a lot of headway. Resting it was was a huge key because um, you know the impact on the field is just so great that uh, just giving it some time to breathe, opening it up, aerating it, and, and overseeding it, and, and getting the um, the pH right in the soil. We're, we're pretty much there now. And now uh, in the fall, we actually purchased, we're purchasing an aerator. So we're going to be able to in-house do the aeration uh, going forward to the Samani. And uh, we're going to be doing the aerating and sealing. It'll be fully irrigated. And my hope is by, by the end of fall, we really have something uh, something substantial to show for, for all of our athletes. Are we looking to rest any of our other fields? Uh, we haven't talked about it. I, mm -hmm. I, identify a few, but it's difficult. Uh, like at High School North, we have the, uh, the soccer slash lacrosse fields. We have nowhere to go. Uh, we, you know, it's, there's a definite need there. Um, it's a matter of, you know, well, we'll feel short at High School North. So if, uh, if the opportunity is, could arise, we will. And Rich Carroll and I have spoke about trying to figure out, you know, scheduling to, to do that. Um, but we, you know, we haven't come up with, with anything yet. But we, we are discussing that. Okay, my last question is, with the storm the other night and all the damage done, how did our buildings hold up? Are there any problems, any leaks? Uh, no, I, we had, uh, we did have one leak at, uh, at high school in Newark, but it was a, uh, it's a solder joint within uh, one of the uh, roof drain flanges. So uh, I had my guys up there today. Uh, and they were soldering that, and we think we got it, you know, next, next time. So our new roofs really held up? Yeah, yeah, they, uh, it's they're great. doing well. Uh, most of the situations that we do have with the roofs are, aren't really the roofs, they're just flashing mm -hmm. and things like that. But uh, we seem to have a, uh, a pretty good handle on those. Good to hear. Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks
couple of the other things under uh, facilities and finance. Uh, we have on the voting agenda the 2019-2020 uh, waivers for toilet room facilities. And just to remind everybody uh, what those are, when we have rooms that we're using for kindergarten classes that do not have toilet facilities or bathrooms directly in the classroom, we need to get a waiver from the county office to say how we're going to address that uh, so that the students will be supervised going back and forth to the facilities. So uh, we have submit, you know, we have put together applications to submit to the county for this year, uh, and they are listed on your agenda. Just to compare that to last year, we actually have two less classrooms that we are looking for waivers on. Uh, last year, in addition to the ones that were on the agenda, uh, we also have waivers for Fairview and New Monmouth, and we do not need those this year uh, because of the collapsing of some classes. They don't need those rooms for kindergarten. So um, upon the board's approval, we'll submit it to the county office. They review it. They actually come out and look at it before they approve it. So. Then under finance, we have uh, an update item. We did receive uh, our allocation we've been talking about this and the fact that we don't get it till July but we did receive our 2018-19 allocation for extraordinary aid and just to refresh your memory what extraordinary aid is it's the, it's funds that we receive from the state after submitting costs that are over certain thresholds for special education students it's for high costs uh, so this year our award amount was one million seven hundred and thirty one thousand dollars uh, and well, 200, 217, so a million two, 731, 217. Um, but just to give you some perspective, the costs that we submitted uh, that were over the thresholds uh, were $2,950,000 of 419. So based upon uh, those numbers, the percentage of award to cost submitted uh, is about 59%. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the media about increased funding for extraordinary aid and, and so forth. We did receive more money than we did last year. Last year we received a million six hundred and thirty thousand. Uh, we submitted costs of about three point two million dollars, which ended up being fifty percent. So comparing just year over year, it's a nine percent increase. But if you take a look at a five year picture, uh, going back to 2017, 16, and 15, you know, we were receiving percentages of award versus costs of 57%, 56%, 50, and 59% back in 2015. So um, although we did receive 9% more, we also received 59% of the cost back in 2015. So it sort of dipped down and went back up again. So we're basically back to where we were five years ago. Uh, so in that time, you know, our costs have gone up uh, that we can submit uh, over $900,000, uh, we're receiving about $547,000 more in aid, but you know, basically the disparity uh, between those you know, is, has grown about $388,000. So we just wanted to put that in perspective, and we're grateful that we'd be receiving additional more funding than we did last year, but again, you know, we're really not any better off than we were five years ago. So that, that's the update. Uh, we do also receive money for non-public transportation uh, reimbursement. That's something we also get every year in July. Uh, last year, for the 17-18 year, we received about 91000 This year, uh, we did get 166000 uh, The monies are based upon what we submit on our daily, uh, our daily annual report of uh, transportation to the state. Uh, so it's based upon the routes that we're running and our costs and so forth. So uh, we also receive that money as well. Um, and just to also clarify, we do budget for extraordinary aid in our budget. So uh, we do have a, a revenue amount already that was built into the 1819 budget for extraordinary aid. So, you know, this was a little bit higher than what we had budgeted. But you know, we budgeted a million three, we got a million seven. Um, but you know, the amounts have fluctuated over the last five years between 1.1 million and 1.7, so you never know exactly what you're going to end up getting. So we do our best to incorporate that into the budget. Uh, so that's the update on extraordinary aid. Uh, we have voting agenda items. We have the financial reports for June 30th and the bill list. 
you will notice that the June 30th reports say draft. The reason they say draft is because June 30th is our fiscal year end. So until we complete our audit and we and everything is completely finalized, you know, they will say draft when we finalize the audit. We will um, also put a, a secretary's report on there that would be the final. Uh, there are not usually any significant, there, there are minor changes, but it's technically not a final report until we have it audited. So that's why it says draft. Uh, we also have uh, under finance, uh, we, this turns on the agenda, the, we have the grant funding or allocations for the um, ESEA salaries. And we also have uh, on, on the agenda our non-public uh, allocations that are listed here that we, we are a conduit for non-public uh, funding. Uh, for various areas, nursing, security, technology, and textbooks. So we receive those monies, but they go back out to the school. So we're, again, we're just a pass-through. Uh, the total allocations uh, are listed at the bottom as, and they're allocated per school that's in Middletown. In general, the amounts, um, well, actually, you know, some of them are higher than last year, some are lower. Uh, it doesn't really impact us because we're passing the money through, but. You know, there are there have been so, some fluctuations there. They did get more in security um, this year, so but they also increased last year's amounts. Uh, but then this year's amount that they also uh, they got was also higher. Uh, the original allocation last year was 189,000. Uh, Though that was increased during the during last year, and now it's at 359. So they've maintained a higher level of, of funding for that. We have some transportation routes on the agenda for approval. We're continuing to finalize those uh, for next year. And that's, you know, that's essentially what we have under finance. Amy, are we having any problems getting buses for our after school activities? We're doing pretty well. Um, I, I will say, though, that we, we just recently were informed by one of our vendors that uh, routes that we originally were um, under the impression from them that they were renewing, uh, they do not want to service for next year. So we're in the process of going back and forth and seeing what the options are there. If, we, if they don't, if we can't get to a point where they're going to honor uh, the commitment to service out and put them back out to bid, but in general we're doing pretty well. So I have a question on the transportation we went from 90 to 166 91 to 166 okay I know what that is but I just want to know did they increase as far as price wise or did we increase routes that more children are going to the other schools in general the enrollments have dropped um, some of the uh, routes are more expensive than they used to be because, you know, the prices have gone up in transportation. Quite a lot. You know, we also don't know, you know, based upon the notice that we get, you know, if they put more money in that pool to allocate, you know, we may have gotten some more money because of that too. You know, and don't forget also that they recently, in the last couple of years, increased uh, the amount that you families can receive an aid in lieu, which is also a non-public transportation cost, uh, where it was $894 for several years, just in the last couple of years, it's gone up to 1000 So if we cannot secure transportation for a non-public route, uh, for within the cost limits that they give you, it's not, you can't spend more than $1,000 per student on a route, uh, then we would give the family the aid in lieu, so we would give them the thousand dollars in lieu of the transportation. So that um, that alone has increased as well. So, did we do that much? What's that? Did we give the aid in lieu that much? We do. Um, we we do. Uh, I don't have the exact number of families, but there's there's quite a few that we're you know that we're giving the aid in lieu to where we can't secure the transportation okay. within the cost, and we give the families the money to defray the cost of the transportation. Okay. That's per state law, as we have to do. Right. So. That's that's all I have. We are having a facilities finance meeting, committee meeting on October uh, October thirteenth. So uh, we'll look at we'll have an agenda for that and report out at the August meeting. So. All right. I just have really two very quick voting agenda items. 
we have our 1920 athletic um, ticket prices, which have not changed since last year, but they are board approved every year. And we also are making a slight change to our school times. The preschool AM and the preschool self-contained um, delayed opening um, times have um, been aligned to be 10.30 before they were 15 minutes apart and it, it did really didn't make that much sense. So they'll both be 10.30, but your regular school times and for your regular programs, even the delayed opening and early dismissals are same thing. Okay. Um, for our next meeting that we have, uh, we're gonna have a workshop meeting. Do you think we can get an update on the uniforms, the sports uniforms, what's happening as far as uh, we were ordering uh, wrestling uniforms, band uniforms, what's on the program yet? Um, I haven't heard about that for a while. I'm thinking maybe we should have a, um, a committee meeting rather than do that as a, because that's kind of a drill it down to something that we, you know, I mean, well, we could we do it. We don't have the whole curriculum meeting. We could get the information provided to you. How about that? Yeah. 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 We don't, don't have that. co-curricula anyone. Like, yeah. you know, we used to have that once in a while. Yeah. Well, because we'll I haven't heard that. about we'll, it. We'll get that information yeah. as soon as possible. We'll get it up on the portal, yeah. and then that way, if you have any questions, we can talk about it the next week. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, moving on to shared services. Uh, I'm going to do a quick update, and then Pam, you were, because I had to leave early if you want to pick up the end of the meeting. Okay. So, um, just two items, no, nothing for the board to take action on here. Um, the first is that the uh, township is pursuing um, a grant with the county uh, to do some work at Normandy Fields, uh, Normandy Park, should I say. Um, they want to reconfigure, add some uh, rectangular fields, turf fields, uh, replace the baseball field there. Uh, the issue is that it potentially can impact both the basketball and tennis courts. Uh, the impact of the Board of Education is that we utilize those tennis courts for High School South um, tennis. Uh, so that uh, plan is currently in discussion. There's been no decision made, um, and there's more to come on that. Uh, the second item uh, to discuss with the board is the property that is next to River Plaza School on the corner there. The township uh, is looking to develop that into a parking lot for Porson Park. Um, as it is right next to River Plaza, they are offering to tie it into the parking lot at River Plaza and also connect it to Navisink River Road. Uh, however, they'll be looking to us for some cost uh, uh, deferment uh, to pave that connection. I think Amy has it to do uh, to look up uh, some different costs over there, correct? Yes, but you know it's also going to depend upon the scope of work mm -hmm. because as we looked at what the plan was that uh, they were showing, it showed more than just tying it in. There was actually some other site work at River Plaza that we're not necessarily sure that we would need uh, at this point. So we would really have to determine what exactly we wanted to do if anything, besides that tie-in on our own property to determine the cost. Right. Is so. the plan different from the plan they presented like five years ago? Not, it, it's that same concept. They've just, they, they've had a little bit more of a detailed drawing about um, not just that tie-in to River Plaza's parking lot, but you know, some reconfiguration of lanes and things like that that we're not sure that we, I mean, that, that was their rough concept. That's certainly not a detailed that you'd be doing the work off of but do we um, still have safety um, security money because we had a safety grant years ago we talked about tying it into that project yeah we would we would have to look and see you know we've utilized some of those funds for some other projects um, we actually you know just even recently used some for the high school north auditorium but we do have some of those funds left but again until we determine exactly what we want to do it's going to be hard to come up with a price. Whether if we kept it to just the connection, that's one thing. If we decide to do some other work on our property, that would make it a bigger project. So well, I'm just curious if we were up for another grant for that. We do get we money. do get funds every year. Um, we wouldn't know what our allocation for this year is though until the spring. Yeah. And I know it's going to take time to come up with a cost, but that was something that's been in the works for a long time because of the one way in, one way out of that. Um, Hubbard Avenue and how dangerous it is. Yeah, I mean, we almost, you know, I was giving some thought to this today because I know Mr. Roger Dude emailed me about this too, and, you know, we would almost need to probably get somebody to look at our site and see what they would recommend for us to do in conjunction with this project, you know, in order for us to come up with some kind of scope or cost. 
Yeah, because I know in the past that when when they looked at it, something would have to be done with that parking lot behind exactly um, yes. River Plaza, and also with the playground where it starts and where it ends right. for safety measures. Right. So, so um, we, we will probably, we'll probably have to bring someone in there to give us some some guidance on that. Yeah. yeah the plan is also to alleviate um, some of the parking on the streets, on the local streets, they've been getting some put in the parking space. Right, so they were going to add parking spaces. That we could use during the school day. Right. Yeah. 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 And I mean, hopefully you wouldn't have people driving through, they were using it as a, right. you wouldn't want that. So right. that was a concern. Um, and just the, the one last thing is that we, we discussed um, that the township would like to use Thompson when it's ready, um, Saturdays and Sundays, three games on each field per day. Um, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, if we do have it available in the fall or late fall, if, if it is ready. Um, that's well, enough to that's like football? Uh, it's, no. It's uh, lacrosse and soccer. Okay. The, the specifics of that, I guess, are new to me. When we were yes. at the committee meeting, we had asked them to let us know what kind of usage they were looking for, and that had not been communicated to me as of yet. So yes, I'm just giving you now. Yeah, I have yeah. to have my notes here. Yeah. So, um, you know, we had asked them to let us know what they were looking for so we could evaluate. So if they've got something specific in mind, I'll reach out to Janet Dellen tomorrow and see if we can get that firmed up. Great. All right. I don't believe it is the flag football though, because at times it did tell me that um, they were, t yeah, they were intending to use Bayview yeah, still for that. The shed is over there. Yeah. Yeah. And just the um, the, the uh, committee just felt strongly that we would like them to keep the tennis court there at Normandy because the kids at High School South use it, like you said, and to move them to another tennis court in town would incur us uh, trans transportation costs. So we were trying to push for that. Yeah, and, I mean, in general, the, uh, the plan at Normandy is an interesting plan. The, the impact on our kids, uh, on our tennis uh, teams at South uh, is the obvious impact. But the other thing is that the neighborhoods, you know, around Normandy Park, those children do use that. You know, our students do use that off hours, you know, drop by there in the summertime in the evening, and the courts are lit, and there's always kids down there. So I just worry you know, that they will take down the basketball courts and our kids are going to get impacted by not having someplace to go play. You know, whether they can alleviate that by lighting the courts at that slot, for example, and improving those, that, you know, that's obviously the line to discuss the committee. Right. So. And um, they're planning on keeping the um, hockey court, the roller hockey court. Yeah, it's the only one in the country. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, Shared Services. All right. Thanks, Nick. Um, next is strategic planning update. Um, John's not here tonight. Right, oh yes, okay. So we have been working on the survey that will go out um, at back to school night, so it'll be available to you. So we're just trying to get some input from the board um, to finalize the survey to go out. And that's as far as we've gone. We're looking to set uh, three forums and um, make sure that the public knows about them and will come and join us in our strategic plan um, going forward. So that's basically all the discussion we've had so far. We, we do need to set the forum dates and that's something that I know that everybody's been discussing and trying to decide the timing of them and yes. whether we wanted to do evenings, Saturdays. Um, so I, she did, they did actually contact me again today to see if we had made any progress in setting those dates. I, I think what we need to do probably within the next two weeks is get another uh, strategic plan committee meeting on the calendar or we can do dates after this meeting. Uh, just to circle back because I know summertime is tough, but if we get to nail these points down and get some draft dates for the public forum so that way we can kick them around before we're into August and nobody does anything until you know, the late August when we start prepping. Go back to school. My concern is that we initially discussed having the forum in September, but then the last back to school night, I believe, is at High School North on October 3rd. So I was wondering if we couldn't push it back so that we have all that data from the surveys that we give out at back to school night at High School North as well to be part of the discussion. That's, that's good feedback for schoolhouse strategies. I, yeah. I'm in favor of moving it back a little bit as well. Um, I just think that you'll get a better response as people get settled into, you know, back to school comes through. 
Um, I think putting one of the putting one of the forums further up um, is just going to be too much time on people's calendars because when they have back to school nights, they have everybody getting into their you know, their fall routines, and we have the holidays right there at the end of September. It's just kind of a, a calendar minefield. Yeah. So, and yeah. Schoolhouse Strategies had talked about having presence at Middletown Day to promote the, our strategic planning process and to even hand out surveys. And that's typically the, I, they have the date set, it's like the last Saturday in September. So like the 26th, yes. the 25th. We can, right. hand, we can hand out Thursdays with our PowerPoint presentation. September 26th? Yeah. Yeah. It's usually around yes. that weekend, okay. whatever the date right. They have, you know, have the date set, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I guess tying into what everybody else is saying, if they're going to be there trying to raise public awareness of the whole the process. Exactly. We can yeah. have surveys there. Available well, they, right, them. that's what they yeah. said. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay. Speaking of our surveys, how do we know our input is going to be put into that survey? Because we sent, so I know I sent my input yes. to you. Yes, and so we have our final draft um, that our committee chair has worked out and sent to Amy, I believe. Yes, I mean, I wasn't sure if that was... I don't think that's final, final. Yeah, but that was, that hasn't been issued as the... the the final version. No, but we have. Yeah. I do have what was emailed. Obviously, that's topic one for that committee meeting. Yeah, we're exactly. talking about it in the next two weeks. Maybe. I'm sorry. I couldn't. See, that would be topic one for. The yes. Meeting. Yes. And then the idea is to bring it to the full board. No, before we bring it to the public. Well, I think that you know when we come out with what's going to be on the survey, the, the board needs to be aware. Obviously, yeah. and as Joan said, we want to make sure that everybody has contributed um, their thoughts to what should be included. Either sees that represented on the survey or understand why it's not. I think that's that's fair. Um, I, I would imagine that the draft that John has going you know, indicates that in the comments. So um, you know as the as the shared services that's for, as the strategic planning thing, uh, we should we should be able to come to that final resolution, be able to address all the comments that have come in and then present it at the next workshop. That would be my expectation. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I mean, from what I saw, the last um, version that John sent had included everything um, that people sent us. You know, maybe worded a little different, but mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Moving on to personnel. Oh, it's closed session, right? Yeah. No. All the way uh, just, just, one just the one. Oh, yeah. that says substitute I know, session. It's unusual. Uh, but questions about that. Um, I just wanted to give a quick update on the transition with ESS for our substitute staffing um, services. So uh, we've had multiple meetings with the ESS uh, leadership team uh, over the last two or three weeks. Um, active substitutes, as you know, I think you all received a copy of the letter that was sent out to our active substitutes in good standing. Um, they were contacted the first week of July, immediately following our June board meeting. Uh, they were mailed a letter, they were emailed, and a posting was put on our district website to alert them to the new partnership and the steps that they needed to take um, to maintain uh, their presence in our schools and serving as substitutes. So two in-person transition meetings and discussions have already taken place between myself, Amy, uh, Mary Ellen Walker, Dr. George, Rosie, and uh, their leadership team. Uh, ESS has been very receptive to our needs uh, that we've communicated to them and our expectations. In-person transition meetings with substitutes have already begun. Uh, of our approximately 250 active subs, 169 as of Monday already started their paperwork form employment with ESS. 97 attended one of the two meetings with ESS last week and have completed all their paperwork and have received their IDs. 110 have responded and are attending uh, one of the meetings held this week. So by the end of this week, almost, you know, I would say more than two thirds of our active subs will have already been processed uh, within the first three weeks of the transition. Um, ESS will be categorizing, uh, flagging our uh, former MTPS subs as preferred or priority subs for our district. So they will have, as we discussed at our last meeting, um, uh, first access to vacancies and jobs how does that work, Kim? I'm sorry to... It, it, it's in ASOP. So um, it's a system that we already use in the district. It's a system that our subs were already using. Uh, it's where our employees report their absences. And ASOP communicates with our active substitutes to let them know that there are job vacancies, uh, you know, First. based. Okay. So ESS will flag 
all of our former subs who have been working in our district for the past you know, year or more. Um, and they will have uh, a window of opportunity, and this is what we've always done anyway, because uh, teachers can actually set up a preferred list for themselves, you know, an individual teacher with right. certain subs. They will have first opportunity to take the jobs, accept the job uh, vacancies, um, before they go out to any other ESS employees. Is there like a, a, a amount of time, like a, a certain amount of days that you have to reply by, or do you use It depends on when the vacancy is going to exist. So if I wake up in the morning and it's 5.30 and it's that day I'm putting a, a, a vacancy <laughs> in for, of course the window is much shorter because someone has to be there, especially if you're a high school teacher, you know, in, um, by, by 7.15. So if it's a that day, usually the window is like a half an hour, depending on when the vacancy was created and how close it is to the school start time. If it's a couple days in advance, then it could be up to like the day before, where our subs have priority. But that's something that we have to constantly tweak because we have to make sure that we have the subs. So if we see we have vacancies that have been sitting there, you know, and no one's picking them up, we have to lift sometimes that, that, um, that priority, that preferred option, because we got to make sure that we have someone there to uh, work with those students. Kim, how, how does somebody get added to the priority list for next year? So let so so before ESS came along, right? You get hired as a sub in the district, you know, and you would sub. Let's say you were always going to do mom, and you were always going to Thompson or whatever. And then next year, you know, people knew who you were, the teachers knew who you were, they could add them, add you to their priority list under ESS. How, you know, let's say I'm coming in as a brand new sub and I used to do all my subbing in Hazlitt, but I live in Middletown, and this is an opportunity for me to get into Middletown. How do I become preferred in Middletown for next year? Um, well, based on our request after our last discussion, our current subs will first be flagged as priority. Mm -hmm. um, once that, ex that period has extended, then any ESS employee will have opportunity to take the jobs. Um, if we started opening up that priority to any new subs, it would further limit our existing subs from those opportunities. But doesn't that mean that over time the priority list will just disappear? No. Well, I mean, unless all, of, unless all of a sudden all of our let's say subs. Let's say next year five or ten subs retire and get permanent mm -hmm. jobs. So from having 160 priority subs, now you have 150. Right. And then next year five or ten or 20, you know, get now the priority list goes down. I mean, no, potentially. Mathematically, well. Well, yes. I mean, we have about 250 active subs. So if five or ten come off, you're, you know, you're talking, you're talking about like a 15 to 20 year period using that example. So okay. how do, so then how do our teachers establish a, uh, reestablish a priority list? So a new sub, how does it, how does a new substitute teacher become priority? Every year, every year the teachers review their priority list, yeah, they can, and they, they, they can select. Okay. They can actually enact. The teacher can. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't go ahead and add to that just yet because we have 250 active right. subs that we want to make sure have access to our uh, vacancies every day. We don't have that many every day. So we'd be further limiting them if we did that from the district level. The teachers can activate their own preferred sub list. Right. And that's usually what happens. You know, as new subs come on board, the teachers get to know them and then they grow their preferred sub list. I just want to make sure that we're, that we're going to ESS, we haven't set up an opportunity for, for long time subs to continue with No, in fact, I think we're actually probably going in a different direction based upon the feedback I've received from the ESS leadership team. Um, they, we have subs from other districts who are clamoring for work in Middletown right. once they heard that we now have the partnership that we're employed with ESS. So, um, you know, we want to protect and preserve the rights of our former employees first, you know, right now while we have a healthy group of them. Um, but uh, it sounds like there are a lot of ESS employees who will have some probably opportunity to sub in our district throughout the year because there undoubtedly will be occasion where our preferred list will not be enough to serve our needs. And as our teachers get to know those ESS subs, um, I'm sure they'll be growing their list when they're happy with you know the results. Do we know what ESS is offering our subs? Yes, in fact, we've received a lot of positive um, response to that from our former substitutes, as well as some of our bargaining units who are excited to see this new partnership um, because they have heard that a lot, um, you know, they want to see that when they're out, there's someone there to fill their position and to continue the education of the plans they leave. So um, in addition to matching our current uh, daily rate or hourly rates, depending on the assignment, whether it's um, a teacher, a power professional, or secretary, uh, they will have the opportunity to work five days a week, whereas you know previously, um, I think we discussed this, I'm not sure, last, last month, 
Um, you know, our practice was they can only work four days in the district because we have to keep them below a certain threshold um, for ACA uh, uh, requirements. Yes. Um, so they will now have the opportunity to work five days a week. The substitutes are very uh, pleased with that because that increases their take home pay, their weekly pay. In addition to that, they will have opportunity um, to uh, sign on for benefits, health benefits with ESS. Um, they are subject to some contributions, but they are not subject to the same Chapter 78 contributions that uh, civil service um, employees like teachers are and administrators. Uh, but there are numerous plans that ESS offers that they can choose from. So they are very excited about that as well. Um, in addition to that, there are bonuses and there are stipends. Um, you meet certain thresholds, you sell you know, every day for a period of, I'm um, just gonna make up you know, a month, you could be eligible for a bonus. Um, there are sign-on bonuses, so if they recruit friends um, who sign on and do well and perform for the company, the, the other employee can receive a bonus. So, um, am I leaving anything out? I think those were the highlights. Oh, they, they have oh and the 401 k um, options that they have. So I looked at you and I thought about that. It's funny. Um, there are 401 k uh, packages that are available for them as well. So. Um, all of that has been very positively received from our um, substitute course. Uh, we uh, will undoubtedly have days, as Mr. DeFranco and I were just saying, where our preferred subs will not be able to fill our needs. Um, ESS will work with us in advance. Say we have a day where we know we could already see we have a lot of field trips scheduled and we have to have subs fill at the high school for certain blocks, um, in-service days when we roll out new curriculum and we have to have required trainings. Um, we can let them know ahead of time and they can work sooner to secure those vacancies. And we may have to go beyond our preferred sub list to do that. So we have access to their sub, their workforce um, to make sure that our, our fill rates um, are where we want them to be. Long-term replacement subs have been identified by principals um, and principals, as we discussed, will still maintain the authority and the right to hire those long-term subs. Um, they can request and they can interview um, from their own candidate pool and or depending if it's a, a vacancy that comes up suddenly and there is no um, a board meeting that's coming up soon and we need to fill a spot we used to have to put you know a daily sub in there and then there would be multiple transitions for students before a permanent long-term sub would be in place now ESS will be able to put someone like within 48 hours um, and the principal will be able to communicate directly to ESS and they can send them a pool of candidates that they can then screen and interview and select right away and they'll be able to employ them immediately um, so the principals are that's been working out very well um, in, in moving those along uh, we have and like as we said we've received a lot of compliments a lot of positive praise i will say so far the transition process we actually received some emails from some of our subs who said they were hesitant at first they were like a little leery of this but when they went to the meetings ESS was really helpful and it was very simple and, and kind of painless in their words. So everything has been going very well. But Kim, if you are a preferred sub with the teacher, you still have to sign up at ESS. Yes. You still have to go online. Okay, because some people I feel like still don't understand that. And I want to make sure that people understand they have to go online to yes. ESS and sign up. You know, the teacher's not going to call them and ask them to come work. No, they will not be. If they're not employed by ESS, they won't have access to the vacancies okay. to be assigned. And that was explained in the letter that was sent to them. Yes, correct? correct. And posted online and emailed. We've received a couple phone calls, so we have clarified that for some people. So we got hopefully, a couple, yeah. yeah. Um, and one more thing. So if you're on the sub list, um, how could you get taken off the sub list? If you don't show up for a job, do you get taken off the sub list immediately? It depends. I'll be honest. Sometimes it could be that the person had, a, had an emergency. We have had that. Car breaks down. Um, if there are other reasons besides just not showing up, that sometimes our principals identify concerns with substitutes, and they then would have normally in the past called human resources, talked to me, and we would have went through a process of flagging someone as, as someone of concern. ESS will now manage that. They are appointing an, uh, uh, a liaison, an in-district manager, specifically for Middletown. Um, they are in the process of hiring. Um, they've been working with us to identify this person. They're going to pay someone to work in the district with our administrators and manage the substitute pool. Um, so if there are any concerns or issues, the principals will be able to notify this uh, ESS manager directly and immediately. 
and ESS has assured us that we, we will be in the driver's seat. If we want to refuse that cert, that substitute back, you know, to work in any of our classrooms or specific schools, we will have the right to do that. So there's no like general rule, like if we stretch you out. Um, we take it on a case by case situation. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to open the microphone to public comment on agenda items only. So that's anything that's on the agenda. I see some new faces, so I just want to um, make sure to give you our rules and our guidelines for public comment. Um, please remember that this is a public meeting. Anything you say will be a public record. As a result, pursuant to law, the Board of Education cannot respond to you publicly concerning certain matters, such as those regarding an individual student. If there is a matter that you wish to remain private concerning personnel or students, please contact the superintendent's office. Public comment periods shall also be governed by the following rules. Number one, a participant must be recognized by the board president or presiding officer and must preface comments by an announcement of his or her name. We don't do address usually, but... Um, and number two, each statement made by a participant shall be limited to three minutes duration. And number three, no participant may speak more than once on the same topic until all the others who wish to speak on the topic have been heard. Number four, all statements, questions, or inquiries shall be directed to the board president. And any questions or inquiries directed by a participant to another board member shall be redirected to determine if such a statement, question, or inquiry shall be addressed on behalf of the board or by the individual board member. And number five is questions requiring investigation shall be referred by the board to the superintendent's office for consideration and later response. A participant may be asked to submit such questions in a written format. All right, would anyone like to speak on agenda items? Okay. Yes. Hi, my name is Lori Sanzio. Uh, parents with upcoming third grader in Lincroft and seventh grader in Thompson. I've been a Lincoln resident for the past 15 years. I've been a speech pathologist in education for the past 20 years, 10 years in New York, and 10 years in Hazlitt Township Schools. Um, speaking again tonight, I also spoke last meeting to again ask Dr. George and the board to reconsider the practice of reducing grade sections and increasing class sizes to the state maximum of 27 students for third, and four, third to fifth, instead of the current practice, which is 25 for all elementary. I'm here tonight to also to reconsider the possibility of busing Lincroft students who have registered late to other schools if their class is at maximum. Finally, I would like a confirmation that Lincroft School will be adding another section for certain grades, such as for the third grade, and that the policy for the third grade maximum that was discussed at last meeting, if that's going to be brought back down to 25. Um, and also, I know Dr. George had uh, distributed a letter which had enrollment numbers, and I was given the impression from an email that, that was going to be updated tonight as well. It is, okay. Um, I just want to say that, you know, I am concerned, obviously. Um, my daughter, she's a mainstreamed IEP student. Her report card grades this year, her standard based report card in reading, went from threes this whole time, kindergarten first, um, even the beginning of second. By the end of second, they were at twos. Um, I'm not happy with that. I just feel like these increased class sizes, and now the class size will be increased even further, potentially, they're affecting your mainstream students. Your students with IEPs that really would thrive in regular education if the right support, meaning the right class size numbers, were put in place. Um, I believe with these class sizes, there's just too many visual and auditory distractions for these type of students. Like I said last time, I believe your special Asian education costs will continue to rise. And it sounds like from what I heard before, they are rising. Um, parents of IEP students, you know, you don't want them suing for added district placements. The, they want, these parents want to stay here. They want to be part of the community. Anything that you can put in place, but I think the biggest thing would be class size. We cannot have these large class sizes to support these students. Um, also, according to New Jersey, New Jersey State Disability, Disability Law, they also need to be educated close to home, least restrictive environment and close to home. 
at the last board meeting, and you know, I, I do think when you had, met, you had mentioned the possibility option of busing, busing students to Bayview, I do think that you said that with the best intentions, but no one wants to do that. No one wants to send their kid alone on a bus 20 minutes to go into another classroom without their neighbors, without their friends. This type of thing that's happening right now, I feel like you're kind of tearing one group apart. Um, I just spoke to a parent today who was telling me she just moved here. Her second grader, right, looks like they're safe according to the Lincroft numbers that, that Dr. George published. That third grader is not safe. So her second grader is going to go to Lincroft, but her third grader will not go to Lincroft. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So I really hope that that busing thing that I'm hearing is really just a rumor. Um, I'm also hearing that with the kindergartners that some kindergartners who register late possibly are going to get bused to other schools. That's terrible. Okay, Lincroft is a community within itself, in addition to being part of Middletown. No, everyone wants to go, their kids to go to school, as I'm sure your kids have gone to school, with their neighbors, with their friends on the street. Um, so, Excuse me, I'm sorry to jump in. You just wrap it up the time as far Sure. So I just want to add one more thing. I do feel like these years are crucial for their social, emotional, and their education. So if you can please reconsider this policy. Nothing is more important than being able to access your teacher, to appropriately access your, te your teacher and the relationship with these students with their teacher, which is going to be impossible to do with these increasing class sizes. Thank you so much. relocating to um, one of the counties in New Jersey and one of the things that impressed us so much was the community of Lincroft. So I have a little boy that's going into kindergarten and I have um, another boy that is going into third grade. And like Lori and some other parents here, I think that there is a genuine concern with the school and the class size capacity. And, you know, thankful for you to be in a position where you can help change the community and you can be an advocate for student, you know, achievement and school achievement. But I always had the impression that when I would put my children in elementary school that I would have this warm, um, just excited feeling about the school. And my first experiences with this elementary school has been much more of like a hollow experience because there are no guarantees that my child in the third grade and now kindergarten is going to get the appropriate education that I think that he deserves. And I think that these years are so critical for them. And I think that if you have children, you know yourself that it's really, really difficult to be in a class size with so many children, less interaction with the teacher, and just not coming away with an experience that maybe other children in other districts and other schools may have. I had put like a post on my Facebook wall. I had hundreds and hundreds of comments of other people across the United States, private and public. What is their class size for a third grader? No one was near 27. No one, not one. And this is across all different states, counties, public and private. So you are here, you guys can help us make an impact so that our children are not impacted in their grade. And you know, this, this should be something that, like we said, we should feel good about our community and excited and proud of our school. So just being in the position that you are in, I speak as an advocate for my child, for my child's friends, for the parents in the room, and for the people you know, of the school, almost begging you to please help us and please reduce these class sizes for whichever grade is going to be impacted with these high numbers. Thank you so much.
Um, I have an incoming third grader who, at the beginning of third grade, below benchmark. He has gone through the INRS process. We keep meeting with the reading specialist. He is now meeting with the, the teachers consulting, um, working with him. And I had mentioned at my last, at the last meeting that I'm very concerned about what is happening to these students who are on the border, that are we going to be, to save money on class size, are we going to be spending more money for IEPs, for reading specialists? Now, I don't know if this is true or not. I tried to find in the board minutes that Lincroft is getting um, a reading specialist for next year to specifically be working for third grade students. I tried to find it. I don't know if that's true or just rumor. If it's just rumor, it is coming that way. We are going to need more reading specialists, more reading interventionists working with these students. I told you at the last meeting, I'm a teacher for 20 years. I am trained in TC. I understand how reading workshop works. You cannot do what you do effectively with large class size. You cannot meet, you cannot conference, you cannot have the small group instruction that is necessary to make the TC program work the right way. You need to have a much smaller class size. So I'm again asking, can we please reduce the class size? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Robert Pisani. I'm a recently brought resident, uh, moved from Old Bridge, previously from New York. Uh, I had an amazing school year with my kids. I was so proud to bring my kids to this school district because they were rated so highly. And I have a kindergartner, she had an amazing year. She had a class of 19. I had a fifth grader just graduated from Crook Elementary. He had a group of 22, I believe, in his class, which he did very well. He, ex he excelled where he was coming from, Old Bridge, where there was more crowded class sizes. I believe at this point to overcrowd and stick these kids together, they're not going to get the same experience they have this year that they're going to have next year. My kindergarten went from a 19 class to, they're talking about 26 or 27 in the class, possibly in first grade. That's going to be overwhelming. There's no way that one teacher can stand up there and possibly handle that many seven year olds, in fact, six and seven year olds. I know I wouldn't be able to do it personally. I specifically chose Lincroft because of the potential for the school district and the community. I couldn't ask for a better community to move into. I'm so happy that we're here. We're literally here for six months, and I'm thrilled with where I am. Seeing this happening, I feel like it's crumbling around. And I'm asking you, the board, to make a difference, to prevent that from happening. We bought in happy. We're doing our part. We're doing the best we can for our children. You know, to have the schools overcrowded and stripped away from us, it's really you know, they're taking away that luxury, that ability for us to do what we need to do for our children. Uh, I don't know all of the numbers behind it and what's exactly entailed, but I'd be more than happy to get into it. You know, if necessary, when necessary, if the numbers are uh, available for us, the public, to review with you. Uh, it's what I do for a living. I, I create down numbers, and, you know, so I'm more than happy to help you with anything you can do. But the point of the matter is that schools, the classes need to be more accommodated, more accommodated for the kids. Uh, I don't know what brought us to this point exactly, but I have to believe it's new developments coming in, one of which I'm part of. Uh, they probably will burden school districts, but I'm sure that has to have been planned for by the council, by the members here, and by well, everybody, public officials. I would think that they would plan for that part of the building process. Together, we have to sit back and say, okay, well, now we're here, we're having this budgeting crisis. What brought us here? What can we do together to bring that next step and still keep it a tight little community where the classes are right, the kids are learning, happy to go to school. With 19 to 20 kids in the class, my six year old was thrilled to go to school every day. She loved going to school. It was an amazing process. I never had that experience growing up in New York. My son didn't have that experience growing up in Old Bridge. She was thrilled to go to school. It was, it was an amazing process because the teacher could give the one-on-one -on -one attention. And that's what it's all about. It's, it's about children. Why did I move to my children? I don't get it. 
I brought them here for the better life that they can have. And that's what I'm appealing to you to help us continue to better life. You know, I didn't have to move to Lindbergh. I could move anywhere I wanted in the country where it wasn't in that. I came here for a reason. I scoured New Jersey. This is the place I went. Why? Because the community was right. The people were right. The school district was right. Let's not let that move apart. That's all I ask. a lot of concerns from the community. And we had a lot of follow-up. And some of the follow-up was really, I think, proactive and, and, and constructive as far as you know, we address transparency and we appreciate the letters that were sent out and regarding the classroom size. We also asked a couple questions as follow-ups too, and we're still seeking some answers on. And the most important thing that I think uh, many of us are very concerned about is when you look at the bigger picture here, you had increased class sizes, decreases in funding, and a school that over the last two or three years, specifically the Lincroft Elementary, has had suffering test results. They've declined. So what's the plan to fix that? How do we fix that collectively? When you have less money, less focus on the students, and declining test scores. That's the biggest question I have for today. Not to be answered right now, but they have been asked of, and we don't have the answers yet. The strategic plan sounds great. I told you I'll help out with that. Thank Many you. Many of us will as well. That's five years. My third grader, soon to be fourth grader, doesn't have five years. Other parents in the room, they don't have that time either. We need action now. We may commit to that plan, and I will, but we need action now. So again, please take this away and get back to us. What's the plan for the school to increase the results of the students, given the fact that there's more kids per class and less money to spend? Thank you. It is our intention to report that as part of our presentation. So um, I'm hearing a pretty common theme, and we want to be we want to give you the opportunity to speak first, and we want everyone to have the opportunity to speak. But I think that um, the reason, you know, what we're going to be discussing tonight will uh, give a little bit more in depth because as time goes on in the summer, as we had talked about, we get a clear picture. So you can get the latest picture on where we are and what we've been able to do at this point. So, thank you. moved to um, Lincroft on Friday, in fact. Um, well, and, <laughs> thank you. And I just wanted to reiter reiterate what everybody else said, and I'm definitely not prepared. I just heard about this meeting today, but um, we chose Lincroft out of all the possible towns in New Jersey after two years of looking and, and research because of the community combined with the school. And so um, I'm the one with the second grader and the third grader, and it would be, for those of you with more than one child, it would be quite devastating for them to be separated into different schools and one of them gets to walk across the street to the bus stop where 12 other kids on the block are going um, according to our neighbors to live off schools and somebody else gets bus 20 minutes away. Um, I think that would be really quite devastating for our family. Um, nor would I want to see any other kids bus, nor would I want to see class sizes that are that size. Um, we would care specifically because um, there are different things that we all work on. Hi, my name is Terry Kahn. Um, I actually have a junior in the South, and I have a second grader in Thompson. So you might be wondering why I'm here. Here's why I'm here. Um, because as so many people have said, um, here in Lincraft, we are, we are a community. And I think that all of you should know what happens when you have kids who are in a smaller class size. My kids were very, very fortunate because the most we ever had in the school in any of my kids' school, in any of my kids' classes was 21, which was phenomenal. Um, one of my son, my son, who was a junior, had an IEP. He had amazing teachers, both at Lincroft and at Thompson and at South. 
Dr. George, you have many letters in your file because I wrote about all these amazing teachers. Um, and so I think that it's important for you guys to know this is the other side of it. Um, I was very, very fortunate. My son has done, both my sons do very, very well. Um, but my son, who had an IEP starting in Lincroft, is now at, um, at South as a junior. And last semester, everything was like A's and B's. And I, not only do I credit the teachers, but I feel very, very strongly because we were so lucky to have very small classes. So that's why I'm here. I'm here for all my friends and all my neighbors in Lincroft so that you know that it really is a community and it starts not only in, in, in elementary school, but even now that we're at parents. So um, I plead with all of you, and someone said I beg you just for the future because I want all these parents behind me to have the same success that I do. Seeing nobody else come to the microphone, we'll move on to the next agenda item. I need a motion to approve the minutes for executive session on June 19th, our special voting meeting on June 19th, our executive session on June 26th, and our regular voting meeting on June 26th. So moved. I need a second. Second. Mm -hmm. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstention. Moving on to the report of the President, I just wanted to read out our 2019 to 2024 goals that we developed recently. Goal number one is to develop and implement a new five-year district strategic plan. We will work with schoolhouse strategies to guide us through surveys and forums in an effort to obtain input from the entire community that will help shape our five-year district strategic plan. We will oversee the steering committee and strategic planning committee as they formulate solutions to our current district challenges. We will approve recommendations from the superintendent and schoolhouse strategy to provide solutions to our current district challenges that best suit our entire community. Goal number two, continue to work with the township to enhance shared services and shared projects. We will continue to have the Shared Services Committee work together with the township at their monthly meeting to make decisions that benefit both the schools and town equally. Goal number three, we will continue to refine the committee process. With the exception of a personnel committee, which will stay committee of the whole, we will work towards making each committee productive and transparent. We will oversee that the committees share agendas and summaries slash reports from every committee meeting so that the full board has the data necessary to make decisions. We will have the policy committee or other committees when applicable, update non-mandated non policies where necessary to better serve the district's current needs. And lastly, goal number four, schedule and hold a board team building training. We plan a team building outing for the full board to further promote trust and communication. Um, now I'd like to move on to the report of the business administrator, the board secretary. Uh, just need the board to make a motion to accept the financial reports for the month of June and the bill list uh, through July 24th. Oh, okay. Um, so I need a motion to approve 10B. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention. Moving on to the report of the superintendent. I'd like to make a, a motion for um, items one through six for action on items one through six. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm opposed on number one, the bullying and harassment. Abstentions. 
Okay, my update, I'd like to start with our district goals. I think that's behind me as well, right? So our district goals fall into two areas, uh, community partnerships and public relations. Uh, the top of that is a strategic plan, which has been mentioned several times tonight, um, to, re to reflect community values, remain in alignment with federal state guidelines, uh, and uh, al align with long range planning needs. Um, the, the second bullet point is very important was to sustain productive relationships with public and private sectors to promote school improvement and student learning. You'll hear us talk about that more in the partnerships uh, when we get to personalized learning as well. Uh, and then um, uh, the second goal to utilize effective communication applications to enhance positive district culture and support student success. Objectives, uh, building upon the practices that inform the school community of operational, financial, fiscal, instructional programs, district initiatives, and student accomplishments. Uh, and bullet point number two, provide opportunities for collaboration with parents to improve educational outcomes for students. Uh, moving on to student success, uh, the academic resources and opportunities that support and promote well-rounded students. Career readiness opportunities is really in the forefront of uh, and workplace experiences along with corresponding college and career uh, coursework for middle and high school students, a very important part of our personalized learning. Uh, through the course of the year, we're going to build and prepare for the establishment of the MTPS uh, STEAM camp facilitated by MTPS high school students under the supervision and guidance of staff. We're excited about uh, moving forward with that initiative. Uh, and then uh, uh, to continually review, revise, and update curricula and professional development initiatives. Uh, when we talk about our personalized learning, You'll, you'll hear about the personalized learning as it relates to our professional development. And, we'll, and we do report outs twice a year. We'll do one in the late fall. I think we did it around November last year. And then we did it again in uh, February, depending on where we are in the initiatives. It'll be February or March. But that leading and learning goes hand in hand. Personalized learning, uh, really the, the emphasis and, and the approach is to create lifelong learners and the skills necessary to develop that. Uh, so those professional development opportunities to really develop uh, authentic, uh, personalized learning opportunities, planning, preparation for those opportunities for our student will really our students will really be in the forefront. And then tying to that earlier goal with community, uh, making sure that um, the professional development workshops advance the benefits of inclusion and implementation of appropriate accommodations resources to successfully support students in the classroom and in the community. So those are those are our goals. As we said, we'll be reporting out twice a year. One other thing I'd, I'd like to say about that is how they get developed. They get developed with teacher leadership input with our principals, with meetings, with building level principals, uh, all building level administrators, principals, assistant principals, supervisors, directors, uh, central office really looking at multiple data points about what we need to do to improve to be improve student success and communicate effectively from our community. So that that was the first thing on my agenda, and I think the second thing on my agenda is why we were here, and we thank you all for your patience, which is an update um, really of where we are in the process as we develop. As I said in all my emails, this is an ongoing process. Uh, that continues to crystallize and allows us to um, to begin to really formulate the actions we're going to take uh, moving forward based on uh, enrollment projections and numbers. And at, 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 as you can imagine, at the end of the year, there's a uh, there's a lot of changes. People wait to that end of the year which, uh, uh, before uh, moving. It's a process and changing residents, some inside the district, some outside the district. Um, and so through the course of July and into uh, the middle of August, it really starts to crystallize. So without any further ado, I think we heard some of the questions. 
that you had. And this information, this information will be on the website and will be available to you, as well as this whole presentation. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to call my colleagues. It's, a, it's hard to make it bigger because then you lose the head that's the head. So, um, I think it's important though, I really do think it's important as we describe what's happening for uh, for the Lincroft community to see that the impact is across the district and how things are being dealt with are, are consistent and they need to be to make sure that we have equitable resources across the district. So. Um, now that we've had this conversation with the board and they, they know where where we are, I think we will further the conversation. Kim, why don't we start? I'm just trying to make it so you can see the best as possible. I know it's hard. Uh, feel free to move up. That's yeah, the why the front rows are always empty, but we encourage students to come to the front. But this will be available on, you know, the, these enrollment figures will be available on the website. Um, but I will kind of guide you to the areas if you follow the pointer there where Mrs. Walker and I are talking. Um, I'll start, we'll start wide, so you're gonna have to squint for like about five minutes, but then we'll go specific into certain zones. So you'll be able to see the numbers more clearly. Because as Dr. George said, you, it's important to understand that this is not an issue that's, that's singular to any one school. It is a district-wide, you know, perspective that we have to give because it does impact multiple schools and multiple grades. Um, what, what we're currently monitoring and managing. So um, this is a practice, and I'm just going to shrink it down one second for one, uh, while we kind of frame this. This is a practice that we have employed for at least five or six years that I'm aware of since I left River Plaza as a principal. So even when I was there, we were starting this. Um, that we, over the summer, we take a snapshot of our June enrollment, we roll it up into the next grade level, we start to gather and calculate and quantify the number of new registrants, so students who have never attended school in Middletown before who are registering for the first time. And we know that a budget plan has already been put in place back in May, you know, that was approved, a final budget that was approved in April or May. And you need me on the microphone, is that why? Yes, yes. That? we do need you. Okay. So I will roll, I will move up. You want to I'll go over where Mr. DeFranco may be, so then I can see it actually a little yeah, bit. Because if I'm not in front of that screen, I can't talk to you about what I see here. <laughs> so, um, now I'm going to that. <laughs> so, these are figures that are rolled up, like I said, if you didn't hear me before. We take a snapshot in June. We roll up the, the current enrollment seat students who are seated in our, in our classes um, in June into their next grade level. Then we start to capture uh, throughout the month of June and July and then even into August because it is not un unusual for parents to register students literally the day before school is going to start. So we have to take all that into account. In, in many ways we have to predict and we do use past trends to, util to think about once we get into August what we should expect over the next two to three weeks. We know which schools historically we have late registrations for. Um, it is not Lincroft. That is usually not a school where there's a lot of late registration. However, there's changes that are happening to that community, like housing, new housing that's coming online. Um, I can let you know that three years ago, we had similar meetings and parents from Fairview who they were um, experiencing a unique trend in increased enrollment in that area. Um, there was some, some fluctuating enrollments there. We had meetings with Fairview parents at that time because they had similar concerns that are being expressed here tonight from some of the Lincroft residents. Uh, two years ago, we had concerns from Nutswamp parents because there was a lot of turnover in, in existing housing in the Nutswamp area. And there was a lot of new registrants coming online which was creeping up their class sizes. So we had to monitor those um, numbers over that summer. So this year, it's Lincroft. It seems like it's a, it's, it's a rotating theme, but it's a common one because as you have to accommodate for new housing, or unexpected changes in mar hous the housing market, which is you know the turnover of existing homes where people are moving out who didn't have any students attending school, and now they're bringing in younger families with new students. You have to try to try to predict that. It's very hard. I'm just going to be honest about that. Um, but we do we do look back and look at historical trends. 
So this year, what we're actively monitoring is um, the hot spots, like we, we tend to focus on. And those would be the classes and sections where there are the pinks and the reds. Okay, those are where we either are approaching capacity for what we budgeted in terms of positions and classrooms, and where we have either are at capacity or in some cases are already over capacity by one, two, three, four, five students. Okay, so then we have to continue to monitor because over the course of the summer, we also have a lot of students who are exiting buildings. They're either moving to another side of town, so they're now they're, they're, they're moving their student from, say, um, I don't know, I'll pick River Plaza, and now they've purchased a home in Harmony. So we have to account for that and watch uh, those changes. A lot of times we don't get that information until August. Um, parents wait for whatever reason to let us know that they're changing schools. Um, we have had uh, a couple of those come in so far, but not as many as we usually see. So we know that we're, they're probably still coming, students who are going to be exiting uh, schools. Uh, right now, um, just to kind of explain how the chart, and maybe you want to zoom in, to, we'll start with the orange and we'll work our way across. The way the chart is organized, so if you look at it uh, tomorrow, we've organized them into what we call the uh, um, middle school units. That's in, in our language, that's what we kind of refer to them as. So it's the four elementaries that band together to move students forward into whatever they're receiving uh, middle school is. So for example, here in the orange, um, just go up so I get row one again. Thanks, Mr. DeFranco. <laughs> Um, Bayview, Fairview, Leonardo Davis Inc., that's the Bayshore unit, as we refer to it. Um, why there are some schools that have asterisks, I couldn't make a big enough key. We were trying, but maybe for the website we'll include a larger key um, so you can follow along with the chart. Uh, these, are, these are schools who can receive students with, that have existing bus routes. So for example, late, late, you know, we, go to, we get into late August, there are X number of positions. We're one student over in a class, in a school, and we cannot you know, we haven't budgeted for a position to add yet another one, so we will reassign a newly registered student um, to a, another sister school um, in that sending unit, okay? If they come, if they have siblings, they, the family, Mrs. Walker speaks to them, they have the option of moving all of the students into the, the, the new school, the receiving school, or um, separating. That's the parent, that's the family's options that, that I know that you talked to them about. Um, typically, uh, every summer we have maybe five, six families who are affected by that, um, and in any one grade or any one school, it may be one or two students. Typically, it's families who register late in August, because at that point we've already made staffing decisions, St teachers have to be notified of what their teaching position is, and you have to be put getting those classrooms ready. So to create a classroom on August 29th is not an easy feat. If you're a teacher, if you're an administrator, you know what that entails. Um, so typically those are things that we're looking at at that point. Uh, this year, because of budget cuts and because we had to make certain cuts to all levels of personnel, administration, support staff, and teaching positions, um, it's a little bit more challenging. It, you know, it's earlier that we're looking at areas where typically we wouldn't have you know, so many sections, quite honestly, in red already. Um, but because of the way we have to manage the funds right now, there are more that we're um, monitoring and, and watching. We, every year we reserve a certain number of positions to utilize for where we go over capacity from what we projected. So in other words, we have teachers that we've already rehired for May that may or may not have, in, in some cases a small number, don't have an assignment yet. They kind of know from their principal that we're watching enrollments and your, your, your grade level or your school may change because there may be need in another location. We also have certain contracts that because we had retirements or resignations, we haven't filled. We didn't need the, 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 the need, there was no need for whatever the position was that that person previously occupied, so we didn't replace them, and we're holding the budgeted contract to utilize where need now exists. So every summer we do that. We plan for that, um, as most districts do for these reasons. So um, right now, in the Bayview unit, um, what you see here is that we have at Fairview, their kindergarten, their second grade, are we're watching them because they too are reaching capacity, you know, with two classes and using 25 as a class size maximum in kindergarten and second grade, they are nearing um, capacity. So those are, and, and typically Fairview is one of those schools 
where, as I was mentioning earlier, you see some late registrations. Historically, that is a school that, that, we, that we are aware of, that we have to predict and, and plan for. Um, in Bayview in third grade, when um, they are nearing capacity, even when scheduling or projecting 27 students in a class. So we have to watch um, that enrollment there as well. Uh, what we added for everyone to understand is the um, available seats. You know, it's, it's just a term. We certainly don't refer to students as seats. I don't want you to walk away with that impression. But remember, this is a working document that we use for planning purposes. So it's available seats that we have um, within that sending you, within that middle school unit, um, to accommodate for re uh, late registrations, okay, or, re or summer registrations. So why there's two numbers in some cases, there's the asterisk there, like for example, instead of in front of number 13, that's because when you look at those schools that I mentioned earlier that can be receiving schools where existing bus routes already exist, that's the number of available seats that we could fill at Bayview, Fairview, and Leonardo in kindergarten should anyone experience um, uh, achieving max capacity and we don't have a position available to increase a section. The 30 represents how many seats are available across all four schools, including Navisink, where there is no current bus route. So that's a factor that we have to take into consideration. If you ever, for some reason, and it's very unusual, that between now and September 5th, we would see 13 students perhaps show up, and then we would be looking to go to a, another school, we would have to consider, is it um, financially more prudent to open a section or to add on to a bus route? Because now we have to create bus routes to go to a school that doesn't have, that currently have any, like Navisink. So I just wanted to explain um, how this chart is configured. If you scroll down, Mrs. Walker, at the bottom, there are some uh, totals that run. So the first line down here where it says the number of general education sections, I moved the, the um, column over just for our purposes before we'll clean it up. The, right now, Bayview is, enrollment is requiring 15, sec 15 sections, 15 classes, K to five. We had projected 16. We have fewer kindergartners right now in the roles than what we had even a month ago um, for general education placement. So right now, theoretically, we have um, a, a position that we have budgeted for that we may not need at Bayview. And what we do, and every summer what we do is we look to see is there a need in another school for an additional section. Um, so that is pretty much the way that the uh, chart is structured. And so for each sending or middle school unit, it uh, follows the same route. I'm going to jump, I'm going to save you guys for last because there's the most to talk about there. So we'll jump over to the Thorn unit. Um, that's the New Monmouth, Harmony, Ocean Avenue, and Port Monmouth. You can see that there are more sections in that unit that either are approaching capacity or have reached or exceeded capacity. Um, Harmony, for example, second grade is already over capacity. Um, if there's 25 students in a class in second grade as a maximum, they are technically over capacity. So we have to consider what do you do there? Do you add another section or do you talk about reassigning um, the newly registered student? Because that is a newly registered student. Any place where we have the asterisk and a, and a number underneath that indicates that there's a student who did not attend school here last year, but is a newly registered student to the district. Um, because we do not look back and reassign students who attended that school in previous years. Okay, that's, that's not something that we've ever done before. Um, so you can see in, in the lighter shades of, of red, there are five additional sections in that sending zone amongst those four schools that are approaching um, being at capacity as well and are likely could exceed. So going, but you can see there are plenty of seats if we had to reassign students um, to, a, to a sister school in that, in that sending area. So going back now to the Thompson sending area, um, that's the middle of the chart, the blue. You can see there are just as many sections, or almost just as many sections in that sending unit as there are in the Thorn sending unit that we are currently monitoring um, as potential areas of concern where we have to address with staffing. Um, and in both Nutswamp and Lincroft, we have uh, matched capacity. We, have, we are right at capacity for kindergarten. Um, in both those schools, in both Lincroft and uh, Nutswamp, we are at we are over capacity in first grade. So in Nutswamp, we're over capacity by one newly registered student, and in first grade at Lincroft, we're over registered by five newly 
um, uh, identified students. And then in third grade, which much of you are here for, um, that is where we have uh, using 27 as a maximum class size. Um, we are over capacity by two. Um, and uh, in fourth grade, we are over capacity by one. Okay. And uh, at Village, we are, and I'll get to this in a second, we could be a maximum if we go uh, back to 25 students in third grade as a maximum. They would be closed in a sense and then would be at risk of um, being over enrolled. So that is the general numbers. You can see that there are available seats um, in Village and River Plaza to accommodate students in every grade. It does get tighter um, as you get into the second grade and uh, the third grade. So those are areas where we, of course, are most likely to add additional sections because um, you can see that in most other grades, you know, we have plenty of room to accommodate new students registered to the district. So uh, right now what we've gone ahead and looked at, and we kind of, maybe we're gonna have to shrink it down just a little bit, but you have a general idea of what, what's on the chart at this point. Um, right now, if we were to um, talk about plans, and they would be tentative, because we see, you see there are a lot of sections we are still monitoring that are very close to needing additional sections. We uh, do not have budgeted positions to accommodate every single one of these light red or red. That's that I don't know if any district would be able to plan for four, eight, 11, 15, 17 additional teachers. You know, that, that's not usual. Usually that's when you employ practices such as what we've developed here, which is reassigning newly registered students. Um, that's a big number of positions to have to bring online um, after you've already adopted a budget. So we do have um, contracts, like I mentioned, that we can utilize to address and alleviate some of this, um, these pressures and these constraints and these enrollment numbers. Um, and right now, what we would, based on these current enrollments, now over the next couple weeks, again, parents could come in, they could move students out, numbers could go down, there's a lot of things that could happen. All of a sudden, we could get 10 new students who come in, and I'll just use Fairview, because it's the first column I see as I look at the board, you know, register for kindergarten, um, all who need ESL services, and that's where the services are provided, and we would have to maybe uh, uh, alter course. But right now, if we were looking at the numbers, um, as we discussed with the board, our recommendation would be to, knowing what we have and what we can utilize in budgeted positions, reduce the overall um, maximum class size for third grade to 25, which was our uh, previous practice. Um, I'm just going to be honest on behalf of all of us. None of us are comfortable with class sizes of 25, 27. This is something that we've talked about with the principals a lot since last summer when those first waves of cuts were announced after the budget had been adopted. None of us are happy with that. None of us want to see that um, be a practice for our district. Um, that's not what most classes are running. When I get done, we, we can look at what our actual average class sizes are. Um, but we, we are not comfortable with that. And so we would like to utilize, we need automatically, that would require three positions to be added somewhere in the district. One in each one of the sending unit areas. We would likely add a position at Bayview. Well, you would have to, because these are students who have always been enrolled in Bayview School. So you can't go and tell three students they have to move to another school when they've attended there for the first three years of their education. Um, we would add a section um, likely to Lincroft because you would be talking about otherwise having to transfer, uh, what would that be? If you cap them at 75, it would be a lot. It would be eight, <laughs> thank you. Eight students, that's a lot to move, um, to reassign. That would, of course, though, put us in a situation where Village, which is a receiving school, would automatically, as of that day when you make that decision, be at maximum. And River Plaza, which is our other receiving school, um, only have room for one additional student. Um, but if we did that, the good thing is, is that Nutswamp and Lincroft numbers would be low enough that if there was a, a surge of, of enrollment, they would have enough space to accommodate it. Um, and then over in the Thorn sending unit, Port Monmouth would require an additional section because they have one student over 25 and all of them have attended Port Monmouth since you know previous years, so they would require an additional section over there as well um, to keep them under 25. First grade. 
Right, so that's what we would do for third grade. Um, that's our first recommendation. The second recommendation at this point, based upon current enrollments, is to add a first grade section at Lincroft um, because that's a lot of students to have to reassign five of them and um, bring that bring uh, increase those those number of classes in first grade to four and following that um, based upon conversations with our building principals our directors the special education department we are looking to add um, in-class support for in our fourth and fifth grade writing classes um, because those are classes that have larger you know numbers and typically during the day those numbers that you see here you know if you were to say there's probably 22 students in one class and 21 students in another at Fairview in fifth grade in actuality during core instruction that's not probably reflective of the actual numbers because many students leave the class to go to resource so they're probably averaging during core instruction closer to 18 or 19 students in a class. Um, but during writing, it's one of our tested areas that we currently don't provide in class support. So those students come back, and there's no resource for writing either. So they come back into the classroom and the numbers are larger again, and there's not, not enough, um, not enough, but we would like to provide more support. So that would require about five additional positions it's not just for writing though because we have had an uptick in new students coming to the district who require IEP services in our elementaries so these are newly registered students that we did not anticipate or were not you know on our plans when we were drafting our um, special education groups who require services and we will need additional staff, staff to serve so of those five positions that would also help us accommodate those and, and meet those needs of um, the new students IEPs so um, that is where we are at right now as it re relates to elementary and where we would at this point with these numbers at this point in time recommend um, positions be assigned i just want to again clarify that we will continue to monitor though these these numbers you kind of have a little bit more now of an understanding of what we look at and what we monitor on a daily basis with our central office registrar and our principals um, and the conversations that we watch and we, we're all looking at the same chart up in um, in the schools and in central office as we monitor the enrollments. Um, did I leave anything out, Mrs. Walker? Oh, so if you go all the way over, um, thank you for reminding me. Um, there was a lot of talk about average class size, and yes, national averages tend to run around 21 students in a class. That means that's an average. An average means there's probably in some classes 17 or 18, and in some classes 24, 25, 26. Because you can't get an average unless there's some classes that are under that in some classes that are over that so our average in our district if you go across um, to the fourth column over here and you could probably zoom in at this point mrs walker our class size average of course starting with kindergarten because we're going to lose our heading over there on on that row is district-wide 20.8 based upon the current number of projected classes not taking into account adding additional sections in yet so that's of course going to lower that class size average um, but but that this is based upon what we had thought we were going to do, you know, um, a couple weeks ago with the old numbers that we had. So even with the four fewer positions than we just discussed, these are the averages. Uh, kindergarten at 20, first grade at 21, second grade at 21, third grade at 21, almost 22, fourth grade at 23, and fifth grade at 22. So those are the class averages across the district. Um, the other thing I just wanted to uh, highlight that we added to the chart, if you could just uh, scroll down, Mrs. Walker, we've been asked a lot about how you know we manage sections and, and what causes these constraints at times. Having 12 schools, and in some of them with only maybe two classes per grade, that does co co unintendedly cause constraints and inefficiencies. Because with one extra student, you may have to add a whole nother class, you know, which, which comes at a cost to the budget, right? So when we look at our total enrollments by grade and how many sections using our class size maximums, we theoretically, again, this is theoretically, would really need to staff. We'd be looking at if we used um, 27 students in third, fourth, and fifth, we'd need about 149 sections K to five district wide 
using 25 students in third grade, uh, changing that slightly, we would need 151. We are really staffing, and if we add four more positions, we will be staffing 179. We are staffing right now, though, 175. So when you have 12 schools, and some of them, again, with small numbers of classes, where one extra student can create a big need, it just drives an efficiency in some way. And this is one example of that. You know, next year we're going to be staffing 26 or 24, depending on you know where we put put the extra positions, um, classes district wide, that we could be using potentially for other um, reasons or, or or in other ways to maybe further reduce class sizes, um, provide extra supports um, for students. Um, but that that's basically what we're looking at and when you have 12 schools and again some of them with very small student populations It's very hard to create total equity or consistency in class size, but we're pretty close You know with, with, with our averages So did I leave anything out that you wanted to stress or address? Okay. <laughs> it's really hard to open up your brain sometimes and explain everything but we try <laughs> Okay All right, thank you
Yes. Mr. DeFranco? Yes. Mr. Jaimo? Yes. Mrs. Minuis? Yes on everything, no on 13. Mrs. Stella? Yes. Mrs. Rogers? Yes. Okay. Moving on to old business. Okay, uh, moving on to new business. I do. Um, this week we received an email about the new developments on Taylor Lane. So I would like for us to have a discussion um, on maybe being proactive because we know that Thompson is already overcrowded. What can we do to be proactive before people move in that, to that development so that we're not turning them away at Thompson and we're not making it more overcrowded? You know, is there a way that we can um, put on there that that development is going to another school? So I, 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 I want to agree with Mrs. Minuis. I also uh, think it's a shame the gentleman who raised this uh, during public comment, um, I think, had a, an incorrect assumption. So the Township of Middletown, the Planning Board, are under no responsibility to work with the Board of Education when new housing units are being planned. Um, nor does the Board of Education receive any financing or funding to in increase the capacity of our schools. It is entirely left to us and our tax levy to fund that. So I think it's important the public understand that I think there's a, a misconception out there that when uh, something like Four Ponds or Bam Hollow or these new units that are going to go in, that there's some amount of money that comes to the Board of Education to enhance the schools. That is absolutely not true. Um, so I think that it's important for us to get out in front of the next uh, developments. Uh, you know, it was just in the news that uh, Village 35 uh, may include some housing. Um, that will impact Fairview, potentially, I think. Uh, we could get that. It would be Fairview, right? It would be Fairview or New Mama. Or New Mama. All right. Yeah. So I think it's important for us to get out in front of this um, through shared services as well as ourselves. Uh, you know, to lobby the township uh, to get us more involved as well as to take a look at the map and circle these areas and determine where, where we can fit them. Looking at that spreadsheet, it's not a lot of room. So. And the big thing too is when these developments are built, the realtors, no offense, the realtors tell the people buying them where they're going to be going to school. And if we have an issue with overcrowding there, we need to get to them too to say, hey, look, this isn't where their, this development's going to be going. This is where we have space. And people aren't, you know, when they're buying the house, upset that they're not going to the school that they're being told to go if to. If you want my two cents about it, <laughs> as realtors, we're not supposed to tell them anymore right. because of this. We tell them yeah. people that are buying houses, please check with the school district. Yeah. You're zoned here, but you've got to check with the school yeah, district. The, the MLS site puts the schools on there yeah. anyway. No, we don't. The, the, the realtor <laughs> does it. The realtor does it. And most realtors don't put the schools in there. Because we don't want to. <laughs> yeah, well, that's because your realtor did it. So what would be our open. next step to, to be proactive on this? What that we can make a definite um, Yeah, so I guess I would statement. need a motion to move the um, potential owners of the Taylor Lane properties uh, from Thompson to one of our less crowded middle schools. It's closer to the north. Well, I, I, I think that, well, I, I think that we're going to ask you. Thompson, isn't it? The elementary school? Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. I think we have policy. The first thing is to, to, to look at capacity. I, I think we've established this conversation, which is really important. And so now this will move to old business for next meeting. We will give you an update um, uh, on exactly, you know, where we what we think from current enrollments and the projections through the demographic study. I, I do want to say that um, the new properties that have come online that have affected Lincroft, just so everyone's aware of Lincroft, were part of our last demographic study. So, but the, but uh, I can't even say off the top of my head if they're running higher than projected. Uh, but obviously, 
it, it, it's a, there's an impact. Yeah. Right. Um, on my experience on the board for the last 18 years, um, we have gone to town meetings way back when to say, hey, look, these developments are coming in and we're going to be impacted, and we never were impacted. Um, I don't see with this many homes how we're not going to get some kids, but you never know. But just in case, we need to be. You know, that's my thought, and I wasn't expecting yeah. a motion tonight just for us to really dig into this and settle it before the first house is sold. If, well, I, if I may, from a legal standpoint, just to reiterate or, or uh, build upon what uh, Mr. Franco said, um, the, there is no obligation of the Planning Board, Zoning Board, or Municipal Council to communicate with the school district or get permission of the school district from a legal standpoint before new construction, new housing. Uh, goes online that will impact the student body population. Uh, my point by way of reference to Edison, um, uh, from the north of New Jersey, there is a lawsuit filed by that school district against the town for this very issue with the, the boom in development. Um, that lawsuit will likely get dismissed. I don't think it's going anywhere, but I think symbolically it's something that school districts across the state of New Jersey are concerned about um, with you know, good economy, new development, new school-aged children coming online or being enrolled, but not having the, the, the funding to kind of follow those students on that board. Right? Not so much for the per pupil funding, but for the infrastructure of your buildings. So it's something that's not, doesn't help me saying this, but it's not unique to us. But Mr. Taylor, is there also a, a negative impact that comes from the developers signing pilot agreements with municipalities and, and the negative impact of our funding? Well, I mean, pilots are essentially payments in lieu of taxes. Uh, typically, uh, the, the school share is not included in that pilot. Um, you know, there are, it is the ability for the municipality to negotiate with the developer um, to uh, direct some or all of those funds to the school district. But again, there's no requirement for the school district to be at that table to negotiate that transaction. Um, but it's something that is being said now publicly on the record. It's something that this school district, um, in conjunction with its administration, uh, can can request or petition the uh, governing body of the township to um, you know, provide you as collectively with a seat at the table so that that can be taken into account, uh, whether pilots are negotiated um, and or just ordinary uh, uh, standard taxes are assessed on the market value of property. I think it's also fair for the public to realize, you know, everybody says we know that developments are coming and we need to plan. It's almost impossible to plan until the kids are actually here because we just don't know what the impact's going to be. Neither, neither does the town, to be fair. Nobody really knows what the impact is going to be. All right, I'd like to open up the microphone to public comment. This could be on any topic. Hi, um, my name is Sue Griffin. I just wanted to say that I'm very sorry that the Project in the College program is working out. It's just one thing. Yes, the learning. I think we hear that all the time. Yeah. Mr. Donnelly, yeah. very, very good about that. And I did have a question. Um, do you know if Brookdale is going to continue their uh, Poseidon program with Neptune uh, Township School District? That is a similar program to the Brookdale Community College program. Right. Uh, the only difference was that was for first generation college students. Yeah. Do you know if that's going to continue? I think it's similarly affected based on the accreditation. The, the issues are clear. We all met the super, the, the issues are clear for all of us and they impact. Uh, all the districts in a similar way. Because that one is still on their website. And if that one is still running, I, I wonder if something could be worked out with our first generation um, college students to work similarly, if, that, if that's an accreditation. We'll follow. Thank you. I, I'd like to see if we can continue that. Way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't really going to get up here to speak. It's not my thing. My name is Allison Schleicher. I have a second grader and a third grader in my craft. I guess I'm, I'm confused at how we're talking about the planning, and I do appreciate, don't know her name, but walking through. Speakers, yes. Speakers, thank you for walking us through that, because it 
I get it, it's hard to, to judge and there are ebbs, natural ebbs and flows of communities and people moving in and out. And these, um, when Bam Hollow and Four Ponds were being built, or they were in the talks, and they were in the talks for a long time, you're talking about large homes with big families coming in, young families, there's still more kids to come in that in our community, and I would assume in Fort Pons, I'm not sure how many. Do we know how many homes are even there? I don't know. So I guess I was just I'm just curious where that plan it's, was. Fort Pons is not fully built out yet. It's not, right? And neither and neither is Van Hollow, right? Correct. So there's probably another eight right. homes, but just I guess I, I understand the, evidence, the natural ebb and flow, but when you have two large communities being built and it's for sure going to affect this one school, um, I'm just not sure what the what the plan was or how that was being figured out. And I do, I implore you, and I thank you for if you're going to be adding that um, the, that class to the third grade. When do you make that decision? We'll finalize it in mid-August, as we've been saying all along. But you know, obviously, we couldn't be more transparent to tell you exactly what our uh, expectations are at this time. And we discussed that with the board. The board gave us okay to have that public discussion at this time. So I, I want to go back to your uh, comments, and I think it ties into what Mrs. Minnie said, which was true, because there were discussions in shared service about this, about and um, and of course with our demographer. And um, so uh, there was discussions that with the overall declining enrollment, and as we talked about the capacity of 12 schools, um, and, and the previous discussions with the boards, uh, with previous boards, you know, the discussions were with the declining enrollments overall, and we're down now, I think, uh, over 6% over the last five years. At the highest point when I first got here, we were over 10,000 students were down 9,600. And I was there to show you the impact that it was, got as high in the beginning when I was here as about 10,300. Now we're down to 9,600. The overall declining enrollment question was and um, uh, property taxes, the impact that education has on property taxes. Are we going to build new facilities? There was a lot of discussion with that. We had, um, you know, in our, in, our, uh, in our last strategic planning and our meetings, and then uh, a committee to, to look at. At that time, we weren't calling our local challenges. We were calling it redistricting. Since the word, we don't want to use that word again. Right. Um, so, um, you know, that those were discussions. Do we build on the current buildings? Uh, the general consensus at that time was the cost to the taxpayers of building onto existing buildings would be absorbed. So, uh, the, 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 you know, um, the, um, the, the, the next discussion was what can we do, and that's really where we are at this strategic plan right now, what can we do to more efficiently utilize um, our, our, uh, our elementary schools right now we're charged with a public education to be thorough, and we take that charge very important the education we deliver to your children, which we think are our children, um, is, is job one, right? But job two is to do it in an efficient manner. And I think that's really what the plan, <clears throat> that's really what this strategic plan and what we're doing here to discuss. We know what we're doing is educationally appropriate, but it's not a long-term solution, putting these sections and moving them around like that. The board knows that. We know that as an administrative team. But we have to work transparently with the public to come up with a long-term solution. <coughs> so that's what we want to do. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, seeing nobody else come to the microphone, I need a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Hi. Hi. Thank you all. Thanks for staying at the end, too. Thank you.